Louisiana Eats is brought to you with support from Zatarans, maker of New Orleans pantry staples like Creole mustard, fish fry, and jambalaya mix since 1889. Recipes and more at zatarans.com. From our studios in the Southern Food and Beverage Museum in New Orleans, this is Louisiana Eats. I'm Poppy Tooker. How much of how you feel is really in your mind? I'm not talking about hypochondria. I'm talking about how your mental attitude can affect your physical well-being and how much of what you consume affects your mental health. Harvard Medical School psychologist Dr. Ronald Siegel is an expert on the topic. He's here to examine humans and happiness and how what you eat or drink may have an amazing effect on your state of mind. That's a topic that Dr. Jay Hutchings is also an authority on. Jay is both a psychiatrist and a gastroenterologist. He joins us to talk about how sometimes what's going on in your head can have a dramatic effect on what's happening in your gut. And Dr. Mignon Mary of The Remedy Room has just the medicine to heal you. She believes that nutrition should be at the forefront of medical therapy. Dr. Mary joins us to explain how she incorporates vitamins with detoxification to have her patients happy and healthy in no time. Feeling a little punk? The doctors are in the house on this week's Louisiana Eats. Browse the self-help section in any bookstore and you'll find shelves of books filled with tips for finding happiness. Dr. Ronald Siegel teaches psychology at Harvard Medical School, and he suggests that the odds of finding that happiness are stacked against us. After all, humans have evolved to survive, not to be happy. The same can be said of food and drink. What started as a means of survival is now complicated by emotional issues like anxiety and depression. But not to worry. We've invited Dr. Siegel into our studio to discuss his research and what he calls the mindfulness solution. Well, let me start by talking about why it's difficult for so many of us to be content. And it really goes back to our evolutionary history. And I want you to imagine one of our ancestors, say Lucy, she's the, the skeleton of somebody who was found uh, from about three and a half or four and a half million years ago. She was about three foot high, and she was hanging out on the African savanna. And we know that she survived because we've got her DNA. She is our shared great, 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 et cetera, grandmother. How did she possibly survive? Well, she had a few things going for her, and the things she had going for her are exactly the same things that unfortunately make life difficult for us today. One thing she had was this ability to think, right? To analyze the past, remember the past, and project it into the future so she could strategize what to do, how to solve problems, and humans think all day long. The problem is our capacity to think isn't just this neutral computer, but we have what cognitive scientists call a very strong negativity bias. My friend Rick Hansen, who's written about this, says, our minds are like Velcro for bad experiences and Teflon for good ones. Bad things happen to us, and they stick in our mind. Good things happen. They slide right off the pan. The, the reason for this makes a lot of sense. If you could imagine Lucy staring at some beige shape be, in, behind some bushes out there in the African savanna, she could make one of two types of errors. The first error, type one error we can call it, would be to say, oh, my God, it's a lion, when it's really just a beige rock. Type two error would be to say, ah, it's a beige rock, when it's really a lion. Now, she could survive thousands of type one errors and still survive, pass on her genes, thrive. One type two error, mistake a lion for a rock, that's the end. So our- (laughs) Goodbye, Lucy. Exactly. And (laughs) goodbye us. Yeah. So we may imagine that there may have been some, you know, happy hominids hanging out in Lucy's day, remembering all the good stuff, expecting good things to happen, holding hands and singing Kumbaya. 
but they weren't our ancestors because statistically they died before they got to reproduce. Our ancestors were the ones who were always anticipating what could go wrong, what I could miss out on, what might not go well. And this negativity bias really sets us up for a lot of suffering. What we find is when the mind isn't involved in either goal-oriented planning or taking care of some kind of business, we just tend to daydream a lot, mostly about ourselves. And we mostly daydream about what we want, whether we'll get what we want, how to get what we want. Or if if we have a family, we daydream about the well-being of our families and the like. And any bad things that have happened, any traumas, any upsetting events, they tend to gurgle up during this this daydreaming. So our normal state of mind, if we're not distracted by some kind of entertainment, is to think a lot. And a lot of those thoughts are not happy thoughts. In our Declaration of Independence, we say, you know, we have the promise of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But it's interesting, why do we have to pursue it like some kind of fugitive? Well, this is why. It's because of because we're actually hardwired to survive, but not to be so happy. We're not really hardwired for well-being. We're hardwired for survival. And this is going to lead us to pathways to happiness, including why we use food and drink for happiness. From your point of view, where do those factors of the eating and the drinking come in? You know, some people say that they drink exclusively for the taste, but we probably wouldn't be drinking it if it didn't also have an intoxicating, an intoxicating effect. effect, right? So what draws us to intoxication? And this is, this is interesting. One of the things that draws us to intoxication is, well, it helps cut the anxiety of the fight or flight response. A lot of us feel more tense or more anxious than we'd like to just living a normal life. And when we have a drink or wine or beer, we tend to relax a little bit. And that's really just reversing this fight or flight response, which for us as humans is activated all day long with all sorts of symbolic threats like, oh, what will people think of me? Or, or will I lose money? Or, or things like that. Or did I do a good job on this or didn't I? All these worries all result in a bit of tension. And alcohol tends to loosen that a bit. Um, and in moderation, that seems not to be a problem for people. Uh, now something else alcohol does for us is it tends to take us out of our thought stream a little bit. Now, it is possible, of course, to drink a lot and get stuck in some kind of repetitive thought. You know, people talk about that as a sort of bad drunk state. Mm -hmm. But for many of us, it kind of takes us out of the things that we're worrying about, thinking about all day. And we kind of even know that when we've had a couple of drinks, it's not a good time to make big plans. Yeah. You know, so we sort of. Yeah. So we sort of put that aside. So so we step out of the thought stream and we tend to come more into whatever is going on. You know, you know, the the colors around us, the tastes of of food, the, the, the talking with other people. Another thing that it does, which, and you can see all of these are sort of helping with Lucy's problem, if you will, yeah. um, is it helps us to connect to others. A lot of times what makes it hard for people to be really comfortable with other people is they, there's a little bit of social anxiety, a little bit of worries. What will this person think of me? How am I doing? What's the meaning of the relationship to them? That kind of thing. Or sometimes it's our judgments, you know, where, you know, when we go through the woods and we see trees in every different shape and color and size and some are bent, some are straight, some are lying on the ground, we think, that's, it's the forest. It's lovely. But as soon as you get out in the world of people, the judgments start flying. You know, that's a good one. That's an attractive one. That's an unattractive one. That's one who, who's superior to me in some way. That's one who's inferior to me in some way. And all of that makes it hard to connect. And when people drink a little bit, they sort of soften their judgments. They can actually feel connected. And there are a lot of people who feel, get to feel connected, get to feel part of the primate group, if you will, when they've had some drinks. And that, too, in moderation is probably okay. But all of these things, if we do it to excess, become problematic for us. And if every time you have some anxiety you need to drink, well, you're, gonna, you're not going to learn how to manage that anxiety in other ways because it's actually okay to feel anxious sometimes and do what you need to do um, even though you're feeling anxious. And that's an important skill to have. So both food and drink can kind of help us if we use them the right way and in moderation, or they can really get in the way of pathways to happiness. Although what the scientific research shows us across the board is if we can train our minds and our attention to be a little less caught in our constant thinking and worrying about stuff and a little bit more simply in the present moment 
feeling our full range of feelings, including the positive ones and things like sadness or fear or anger, and really let ourselves be present to the whole, uh, the whole kaleidoscope of human experience, people have a lot more well-being. They're not always in a up mood, but they feel much better about living their lives. Things feel meaningful. They feel connected to one another, um, and they're, they're happier in a, in a deeper way. I'm fascinated by how you term this, the, the phrase fourth drive. It's pretty universal. That, uh, and in fact, it does seem that, that other species of animals are actually drawn to uh, plants and things that either make them relax or uh, in some way have an intoxicating effect. It seems to me that what, what draws people to intoxication, though, most broadly, is it's hard to be a human being. We're hardwired for survival in ways that in the modern world make for a lot of difficult feelings uh, coming up. And we don't all talk about this freely because part of what gets us hooked in terms of self-esteem and our sort of social ranking is we think, oh, well, that person's happy and successful, so they're doing better than I am because I'm anxious or I'm sad or I'm lonely or I'm conflicted about how my marriage is going or, or I'm worried about my kids. Uh, so people don't advertise that much um, that it's hard to be a human being. And yet it is hard to be a human being. And so it's not a surprise that humans figured out how to lighten the load with intoxicants from very early on. And, and this would be that, that other drive. It's, it's really the drive to soothe, to comfort, uh, to feel better through substances, which people do do, which works out okay in moderation, but not so well uh, in, in, excess. In, in excess. I can't tell you what an incredible pleasure and an honor it was to have this opportunity to talk with you, Dr. Siegel. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Ronald Siegel, Assistant Professor of Psychology at Harvard Medical School. Next, we'll connect the dots between digestive health and mental health with Dr. John J. Hutchings, who practices both GI medicine and psychiatry in New Orleans. Louisiana Eats returns in a moment. I'm Poppy Tooker. And you're listening to Louisiana Eats, edible content for Louisiana food lovers. Louisiana Eats is brought to you with major support from Rouse's Markets, from Camellia Brand, Beans Done Right, a New Orleans tradition since 1923, and Brennan's Restaurant, home of the original breakfast at Brennan's and flaming Bananas Foster with modern Creole cooking by three-time James Beard finalist Slade Rushing. Breakfast, lunch, dinner, and private events at 417 Royal Street in the French Quarter. Dr. John J. Hutchings is a gastroenterology doctor practicing medicine in New Orleans. He's also a psychiatrist, which gives him a unique perspective on how emotional health and eating habits can overlap to affect the GI tract. When I started out in a medical school, I initially wanted to be a psychiatrist, and one of the things that I noticed was is that a lot of people in psychiatry have a lot of medical problems that will interact with their psychiatric illness and vice versa. So I wanted to make sure that I had the medical background to treat my patients well in psychiatry. And what I found was is that neither one of those is inseparable from the other, that to really be a well-rounded physician, a well-rounded psychiatrist, it was important to have a strong foundation in both. And when I finished my medical school, I wanted to do training in a, in a position where I could continue learning about both fields. So I did a combined residency 
at Tulane University. That's what brought me here to New Orleans in medicine and psychiatry. At, uh, and that uh, allowed me, it really opened up the world to me to what I wanted to do. It gave me an opportunity to do many different things. And what I decided to do was try to find a field where I could practice both. And with that, I learned that gastroenterology, a lot of people express their emotional distress through their bowels. And I had the opportunity to real to do something innovative here and try to treat people more holistically. Now, that sometimes has a, a, a bad connotation to it in modern Western medicine. But honestly, the truth of the matter is, is that people, you can't separate their organ systems. Now, we can think about things separately, but really, when you're dealing with someone, it is a complete package, and you have to think about all the different components that make up a person. So you get references from other gastroenterologists? I do indeed. I get um, from around the region, patients get sent to me with often with combined problems. So they've had a very comprehensive workup. They've had multiple endoscopies where someone has looked into their GI tract with a camera, or they've had multiple different imaging studies like a CT scan or an MRI, and or they've, made, they've been to emergency rooms and different hospitals all around the region, and people throw their hands up and go, well, you know, there's, we can't find anything structurally wrong with you, so we're not sure exactly what to do. So some people are reluctant to come to see a psychiatrist, but when they come to see me as a gastroenterologist, they don't realize that they're also getting that secondary evaluation. And we broach that topic over the time that we meet with one another. I'm very fortunate in the setting I have at LSU that I am given the time to, to meet with patients. So when they come to see me, they actually get to see me for an hour. And so we start from the beginning. I try to figure out when the problem started, what's been going on, and then we start talking about what could be contributing to some of the physical stuff that you're having. And a majority of those patients, we start to uncover that there's some emotional stress that goes along and can be impacting their physical state. And then they start to realize that you know, maybe there is some things that I can do differently that will have a positive impact on my, my on my physical. Nature. Give me some examples of um, problems that have presented themselves, and how you came up with the cure. Well, people will have uh, will come to me with unexplained abdominal pain, so they can't ex- figure out why they're having problems with their bowels. So either that's nausea or vomiting or other issues like having trouble going to the bathroom, either one way or the other. And those patients attribute that all to physical problems with their bowels. And what I try to do with them is talk to them about what's happening with their GI tract. And one of the things that we talk about is is that, you know, there's more innervation in the GI tract for receptors that people associate with depression, then those are serotonergic receptors. Those receptors are found in the GI tract. So the other interesting thing that I explain to patients is is that the the nervous system of the GI system is completely independent of the, the central nervous system. If I were to take your GI tract out and throw it on the table and give it a blood supply and give it the right amount of nutrients, it could go on functioning forever. So that means that with that nervous system and your central nervous system, there is the necessity of the two systems to talk to one another. And with certain patients, particularly patients with functional GI disorders, such as IBS, that's kind of the flagship one, the, the nervous systems are not talking to one another. And what's the cure? How do they set out to get better? Well, unfortunately, there's no magic bullet. But there are some different things that you can do to help patients improve those GI problems. Exercise is a big one. Uh, you know, exercise is very important. Having an active physical uh, activity I also believe that sleep is nature's antidepressant, anti-anxiety, which has a positive influence on your overall well-being as well. And finally, there's diet, and diet is extremely important, particularly with patients with functional GI disorders. So you've got someone who is perhaps depressed, anxious, you know, very common symptoms in the 21st century, in the crazy world that we live in. Are there specific things that you would urge them to consume or not to consume? Great question. So um, let's take a step back and talk about how we get to what's important with nutrition. There's an emerging field investigating the microbiome, which is kind of a fancy word for the bacteria that live in your GI tract. And this emerging area of science has proven that the bacteria that are, is living in your GI tract can have a substantial impact on how your GI tract functions, on how you feel, the amount of abdominal pain that you have, bloating, 
and those sorts of things. So with that, the diet can be influenced by what you eat. So some of the things that are currently being investigated are over-the-counter supplements such as probiotics. Um, you can find those in nutritional stores or in grocery stores, and those are having a uh, uh, have been proven to have some impact on the GI tract. Now, there's not a lot of absolute science showing that it may do a, a tremendous amount of noticeable changes for a lot of people, but for some people in the right patient population, it's probably a good idea to at least consider with your healthcare provider. Any other foods, food supplements, herbs, things that you recommend or that you ask people to restrict? Sure. So one of the things to keep in mind is fermentable foods have a high concentration of what are considered good bacteria. And those good bacteria are often uh, yeasts and other bacteria that are associated with a healthy GI tract. And you can get these quote unquote good bacteria by eating certain substances such as yogurt, particularly uh, yogurt that is, uh, has active yeast cultures. Uh, some other interesting ones are, and that you can find in other areas of the world are such as kimchi, which comes from Korea, which is having a kind of a renaissance in the American food culture. And there's other items such as kefir, uh, which is a fermentable milk that comes from the Caucasus region. And finally, one that uh, you'll find in the New Age culture and the yoga culture is one called kombucha. So uh, kombucha is that you take these active yeast cultures and you allow them to continue to ferment, and uh, it, it makes a kind of a bubbly drink. It's an acquired taste. Well, you know what's fascinating to me is that I understand that it makes some sort of alcohol or alcohol-like substance so that people who should not be drinking really shouldn't be drinking that either. That's correct. So it, any with any fermentation, you have the possibility of creating a, a amount of alcohol. Now, with uh, any of these fermentable products, anything below 0.5% is considered non-alcoholic. That's similar to like a non-alcoholic beer. But if you're not watching the fermentation process, then you can start to uh, move up into the uh, higher alcohol ranges, and you can actually get close to like a, a, a beer with uh, if you're not watching the fermentation. So some patients that have functional GI disorders have to be very careful with fermentable products because it can actually make their symptoms worse. So let's talk about a diet that would be good for a patient with functional GI disorders. So in the, the recent years, it's come to understanding that there are certain foods and food groups that can make IBS symptoms worse. And some of those are the fermentable um, foods that we're talking about today. So anybody that has a functional GI disorder probably should start off with these foods in a small amount and with the understanding that they may actually not be able to tolerate those particular foods. So the, the diet that's being currently touted as the latest and greatest in IBS technology is the FODMAPS diet. And that's an acronym for fermentable, which means makes gas, oligo, dye, and monosaccharides and polyoids, and polyoids are sugar alcohols. So all of these different compounds that can be found in foods are actually different types of sugars. And of course, bacteria and yeast love sugar. That's how you make, that's how you ferment something. So if foods are high in this particular class of, of, of compounds or the compounds, then you, what you see is that you can have more gas production and patients bloat more. So while all these fermentable foods may have positive health benefits for some, they may not be appropriate for everyone. Give me some examples of what people need to be cautious with. Some of the things that you need to be thinking about with sugars are things that have high amounts of um, natural sugar. So, for example, apples. One of the things I was surprised to learn has is high in FODMAPs is chicory, which is you know it's a component of of my favorite coffee here in town. So, there's all kinds of different compounds that you can find in foods that can actually make your symptoms worse. So. What I would suggest for patients to do or for people who are interested in this is actually go and look for a FODMAPS diet and see and do a, a elimination diet to see what may be causing their problems. It's a very restrictive diet. It's, of course, it also takes out other sugars such as lactose, which you find in dairy products, including yogurt. So that's why one of the things that you need to do is start with very small amounts of these products. You can actually find um, non-lactose 
um, yogurts, which would have the probiotics but won't have the sugar. So that's a, that's a possibility. Other things that, to consider is that if you're making kimchi, which we like to do, then you can use red cabbage, which seems to be smaller, uh, has smaller amounts of FODMAPs um, compounds than, say, the, the typical white cabbage, the, the Napa cabbage that's typically used in South Korean cooking. Oh, and I bet it's prettier, too. Yeah, it can be very nice. <laughs> Well, it is such an honor to know you, Dr. Hutchings, and it's such a treat to have you here in the Louisiana Eats studio. Oh, so, thanks. thanks so much for having me. I love, I love coming and talk to you. Dr. John J. Hutchings, practicing gastroenterologist and psychiatrist in New Orleans. The ancient Greek physician Hippocrates said, Let food be thy medicine, and medicine be thy food. It's good advice. But for too long, our society has been consuming processed meals with artificial preservatives and additives, leading to a number of health problems. To combat this, a new movement has been taking place called culinary medicine. It arms doctors with scientifically-based information to help their patients start and maintain a healthier diet. One way is to harness the power of spices. To get a better understanding of culinary medicine, we sat down with Natasha McAller, author of Spice Health Heroes, and met two of those heroes, Dr. Gita Maker-Clark and Dr. Linda Shu. Well, I am thrilled to have you ladies all together in the studio. So welcome. Tell me a little bit about your work and what you all do. I'm Natasha McAller. I'm a chef and a culinary consultant and a cookbook author. I'm Dr. Linda Shu. I'm an internal medicine doctor and a trained chef. And I also teach cooking classes to patients and the community. So primarily, I see patients in primary care, but I've always loved food. That was probably my earliest love from childhood. Ten years into my practice, I felt like I was getting a little burned out, and I went to a conference that combined my interests. It was about food and medicine. And then I decided at that time that I would, I would do that, both for my patients to offer them something new and for myself to reinvigorate my practice. My name is Dr. Geeta Maker-Clark. I'm a family physician. I specialize in integrative medicine. So I am also a primary care physician. I find myself, I found myself from a very young age always being very interested in beyond just what the story was in front of me of what was happening with the physical body, which is what medical school training really does focus on. Um, but growing up in an Indian family, you know, food is treated as a medicine, and that was how I was raised from a very early age. So I found the dichotomy of learning about human health without ever discussing food or spirituality to be very odd. And when I ended up out in the world and working mostly with migrant farm workers who are under a great deal of stress and also dealing with a, a lot of malnutrition, it felt like the right thing to do was to start to bring that interest back into the patient-doctor interaction. So like Linda, I just started having those conversations that really focused around food first, not as the last question when they're walking out the door, but the first question. And treating food as the first medicine before we talked about dosage changes or anything else. Well, it is kind of interesting because we all have to eat to live. Right. And so it seems that you should just automatically have that connection made for you as a doctor. But doctors seem to be far more interested in pills than vegetables. I think that's how we're trained. It's changing a little bit now, you know, thanks to, you know, this work that we're all interested in, and we're still a small minority of the medical profession. But I think it's actually going back to the oldest medicine. And again, really satisfying, I think, for the doctors who are involved in it. But also, I think for patients, it's just, you know, food is common ground, right? We all eat, we all love food. And so I think even more than just talking about it from a health perspective, it's a way of connecting with people. That's what I love about it. Your collaboration really came about through the work that you did with Natasha on her book, Spice Health Heroes. 
Why do you all believe that spices are one of the strongest medicines in our pantry? I mean, they were originally the first medicines that we had. Um, you know, many medications are still derived from spices. Um, but also for me, in talking about food with patients and cooking, it's a, a great way to get people to eat better in more healthy ways with maybe less salt and less fat and less sugar as the only ingredients that they use to season with a whole world of spices. You know, you basically bring the whole world to you through your spice cabinet. It is both the medicine that we had in many of the earliest medical traditions and a great way to introduce cooking. So that's why I love it. The other piece, too, you know, about spices is that they are so richly medicinal. If you look back at these ancient, you know, recipes from every ancient wisdom culture, you find that these are not coincidental uses of spices. You know, you'll have a meat prepared with something that helps cure it and preserve it and help you digest it. And these rich layerings of flavors absolutely, you know, they don't just lighten and brighten the food, but they help you digest it and make the nutrients bioavailable. So we're just now starting to realize how smart our ancestors right. were when it comes yes. to spices. You know, like these are the, the blends they put together taste amazing, but they do amazing things in the body. Give me some specific examples. One of my favorites is turmeric, and now turmeric is kind of like the new cool thing. But turmeric's been around for thousands of years, especially in India. We use it in everything. We start our spice blends usually with turmeric and black pepper. And so now we know scientifically that black pepper improves the absorption of turmeric, and turmeric is a very strong anti-inflammatory, particularly for the gut lining. And we use it often for gut inflammation. So... You know, that was kind of an interesting piece for me to realize that, whoa, these two things that I've been eating since I was a kid and, you know, been in my family forever are actually, you know, a perfect pairing for curing inflammation in the gut. Yeah, in my family background, uh, my family's from Taiwan. Um, there's always been a little bit from traditional Chinese medicine, although not specifically. And this is the kind of interesting thing where, you know, a lot of these are traditions passed down through cultures without any book knowledge necessarily. And so I guess one of the primary flavors in a lot of Chinese food is ginger, which you know can be used and is used uh, still a lot in food, but also as an anti-nausea agent, um, both for seasickness and during pregnancy, for example. I've discovered so many things about spices, uh, studying the, the history and the myths mm -hmm. and the fascinating stories and how wars were won and lost because of spices, because of, of a simple peppercorn or, or a clove. Right. It's, it's extraordinary, the, the, the power of it. And now they're so easily available either in your, in your local shop or community market or some things can be grown depending on where you live. Uh, bay leaves, for instance, can be grown just about anywhere and, and rosemary and uh, spices like that. But the fact that, that it's, they're so available and they do give so much more flavor as well as the nutrients to the food and they're so easy to make and they don't cost very much. Mm -hmm. Lots and lots of attention these days is paid to probiotics. When it comes to supplements, how do you all feel about pills, yogurt? What are your thoughts on all this? There definitely is a role for probiotics, and certainly, you know, gastroenterology specialists will prescribe very high-dose specific um, probiotic supplements to people having various digestive concerns um, or people recovering from a serious acute illness um, just to help rebuild, um, rebuild their gut health. But I think there are also a lot of other over-the-counter probiotics uh, pills that are available. And I think we just don't know. Just like with supplements, they're not really regulated. Mm -hmm. So I think for a person just to go out with, just as with supplements, without any guidance from somebody who really knows about them and just self-select one may not be the best idea. But I just can't tell you how honored I was to have the doctors and the chef in the house. So thank you so much for coming to see us today. Thank you. Thank you, thank Poppy. You. Thank you. Natasha McGowler and Drs. Gita Maker Clark and Linda Shu. No 
matter which diet philosophy you subscribe to, everyone should be eating their greens. Kale, collards, chard, all have a reputation for being a bit bitter and aren't usually everyone's cup of tea. Unless there's bacon involved. Mmm, bacon. That ingredient we all love, but that decidedly does not love us. Luckily, our other best friend, butter, is back in favor again, dietarily speaking. One of my favorite recipes from my first book, The Crescent City Farmer's Market Cookbook, is Swiss chard with anchovy butter. Anchovy haters, you've got to trust me on this one. Easy-to-make anchovy compound butter will pop up any dish from sautéed greens to a savory porterhouse steak. Combine anchovy fillets, peppercorns, and sweet unsalted butter in your food processor. Process until smooth, then roll the compound butter into a log, wrap it in plastic wrap, and refrigerate it for at least a half an hour before using. In the meanwhile, wash your greens well and trim off the tough center rib. Melt a pat of your anchovy butter in a skillet and add the greens. Saute the greens, stirring continuously for just a minute or two, then add some red or white wine vinegar and serve. Easy, delicious, and healthy. What more could you want? For a copy of this recipe, visit poppytooker.com. I'm Poppy Tooker, and Swiss chard with anchovy compound butter is real Louisiana Eats. Healthfully speaking, why are anchovies our friends? Stay with us. We'll answer that question when we come right back. Tooker, and you're listening to Louisiana Eats, edible content for Louisiana food lovers. Louisiana Eats is brought to you with major support from Popeye's Louisiana Kitchen and Zatarain's. Have you caught our Louisiana Eats Quick Bites podcast yet? We've just posted the third episode of my travels in search of the winning Aura King salmon dish. Over the series of three podcasts, we travel to Austin, Texas, Brooklyn, New York, and Los Angeles, California. Just go to poppytooker.com and click on the Quick Bites podcast link to find these podcasts and more. And stay tuned for an upcoming episode of Louisiana Eats, where we'll reveal which chef wins the big prize in New Zealand. And now, back to Louisiana Eats. Here's this week's culinary quiz question, brought to you with support from Popeye's Louisiana Culinary Institute. Healthfully speaking, why are anchovies our friends? Anchovies are rich in protein, vitamins, and minerals, all essential for good health. They contain calcium, iron, magnesium, phosphorus, potassium, sodium, and zinc. Anchovies are a good source of vitamins, such as thiamine, riboflavin, niacin, folate, vitamin C, B12, B6, A, E, and vitamin K. They're also full of fatty acids and good cholesterol, which means they're super heart healthy. But they also improve skin health and strengthen teeth. Anchovies will reduce your risk of osteoporosis and macular degeneration. So please, get over your fear of those tiny little fish and start sneaking them into your meals by using them as a substitute for table salt. The essential body salt of anchovies is simply magical, and I promise you, used correctly, 
they won't taste fishy at all. I'm Poppy Tooker, and you're listening to Louisiana Eats. If you live in or have visited New Orleans, especially around carnival season, you may have spotted a mobile hydration clinic driving around. This doctor's office on wheels is an extension of the Remedy Room, a clinic specializing in infusion therapy to aid in rehydration and detoxification. But as founder, Dr. Mignon Mary explains, there's more to what they do than just help people recover after a long night out. I think we need to change the tagline, too. It's not just about hangovers, but certainly we treat people for dehydration for whatever the cause. Um, Whether you're coming back from a trip from Mexico, we had some racers this week, and then we have people who have chronic disease, who have chronic GI conditions like Crohn's, or maybe they've had bariatric surgery. So for whatever reason, they would be malnourished or needing a nutrient boost. It's amazing what incredibly terrible things vitamin deficiencies can do to your body? I think we live in a world that's keeping us from being well because we're toxic, right? So after 40, we're starting to see more. I I see a lot more women than men, but men are having the problem too, where we live in this environment that's toxic. The food we're eating isn't the best. Um, Even if we eat from great sources, the minerals are not in the soil, And so we're deficient in a lot of vitamins. And even if we draw the blood levels, we may not be off the radar or low enough to be considered deficient on an insurance paper. But if you replenish that vitamin, the patient gets better or the patient can heal. And so it's all about balance. When we talk about healing, it's either going to be dehydration, uh, a nutritional deficiency, or hormonal imbalance, or a toxicity issue. Once we clear those up, then I feel the body can do its thing and and the immune system can kind of pick up the pieces and heal. It really all has to do with what we're putting into and onto our bodies. You and I were talking not too long ago, and you spit out some crazy statistic about women and how many different chemicals we've applied someplace or another before we walk out the door in the morning. Yeah, by the time we're done putting on hairspray and our makeup and our skin cream and our sunscreen and our perfume and the body soap that we got from a store that smells delicious, we have over 250 chemicals on our body. And the skin is our biggest organ, so we're absorbing that, and then we're having to deal with that toxic load. So, again, I always talk about 40 after 40, but... It's because as we age, we're not able to deal with the toxic buildup. That's when we start to feel the effects. When we're young, we have a lot of growth hormone. We're super healers. We are, you know, kind of curing ourselves overnight. Um, But as we age, because the toxic burden gets so high and we don't have as many antioxidants, we don't produce as many. And probably because our diet now has accumulated and gotten worse as well, we're not able to get past that toxic burden. So then we start to feel sick. We're either tired or some of those other hormonal complaints where we don't have good skin turgor or our hair is falling out. Or the biggest complaint I can tell you I see is that people are just in general, they're exhausted. And and it's multifold, but it does come down to what we're eating. So you're probably not going to escape this year without hearing about the microbiome or about the GI tract or the gut. But 80 to 90% of the serotonin, which is our happy hormone, is made in the gut. So what we eat matters the most. And not only what we eat, but the foods we eat need to be the least inflaming foods. So we live in the most amazing food city in the world, but... If we can avoid the foods that cause inflammation and raise our insulin levels, then we can reduce the damage that it does to not only the body but to the brain, and we can keep the good gut flora, the good microbiome growing. One of the things I really wanted to talk about today are the effect of hormones in your 
weight situation. Would you demystify that for us? Yeah. So hormones actually, I think, play the most important role when it comes to weight loss. And if the hormones aren't in balance, then you're not going to have as great a success. And it doesn't matter what diet you choose or what food you're eating, because if you have an excessive amount of the most inflaming hormone, which is insulin, that comes out when you eat quite a bit of sugar or too many carbs or too much protein, insulin is there to help grab any excess sugar and store it for later. So when insulin is out, you're going to store fat. And so Insulin is the most atherogenic or plaque forming and harming hormone, but we need it, right? We can't live without it, but we don't need to have it coming out as often. And the way to do that is to focus more on the vegetables and the good healthy fats like olive oil, avocado, coconut oil, even ghee. And then if you are going to eat meat or fish, then hopefully it's from sources that are going to be the least inflaming, so grass-fed and organic and those things that have the least toxicity. So if you can't get to that phase yet and that's not, you know, you're, you're not able to shop at Whole Foods or at your local market, then start with just reducing the breads and reducing the pastas where you can. So wherever you can reduce the inflaming foods and maybe budget them for another time. So if we can get away from the sugar, the more you get away from it, the less you will want it. But you need to go up on the good fat to sustain you so that you're not hungry for it. And that's where the big difference is in in the newer um, studies showing that fat can keep you full And I think we're kind of going back in time like we always do. You know, everything repeats itself. We're going back to the way our great-great-grandparents used to eat, where we use the lard, we use the good fats, and we, we aren't so afraid of it anymore. So for people who are trying to lose weight, is there something in this penelope of hormones and various things that one needs to be aware of and concerned about besides insulin? Um, The next would be vitamin D. So I think that it should be considered a pro-hormone instead of a vitamin. And we do have to be careful of it because it's fat-soluble, so you can overdose. But there seems to be a scourge these days where almost everyone I check is low. And if you are, you know, under 30, you're going to need to load that vitamin. If I had two tests to check on everyone, if I had one, I'd pick vitamin D, one lab test. If you only give me one in the world, I'd pick D. And then if I had two, I'd pick fasting insulin and D because those are two things that I would do something differently in my management. I would certainly replace, and then I would tell people not to be so afraid of the sun. For a good 20 minutes a day, we can go and get some sunshine without being burned. You know, the burning of the skin is sort of the body's red light to say, okay, you've had enough, right? So. I'm not a big fan of slathering sunscreen, but I am a fan of getting enough vitamin D and, and, and trying to convert on your own through your skin. Dr. Mignon Mary, founder and primary physician of The Remedy Room. That's it for this week's edition of Louisiana Eats, edible content for Louisiana food lovers. Have you visited poppytooker.com lately? That's where you can hear our new Quick Bites podcasts and also order a personalized copy of my new book, the just-released Pascal's Manali Cookbook. You'll find a full list of personal appearances and scheduled signings on the website, too, as well as directions for how to find us. If you've missed an episode of Louisiana Eats, you can hear today's show or catch up on previous editions anytime online at itsneworleans.com. Louisiana Eats is made possible with major support from Popeye's Louisiana Kitchen, Zatarans, Rouse's Markets, Camellia Brand Beans, and from Don Seafood, where the Landry family has been serving real Louisiana Eats since 1934. Visit Don's Seafood at one of their six southern Louisiana locations. Additional support for Louisiana Eats is provided by the shreveport Bossier Convention and Tourist Bureau. And from the Bourbon House, from oysters to redfish, serving fresh Gulf seafood and American whiskey on Bourbon Street. Original theme music composed by David Pomerleau and performed by Johnny Sketch and the Dirty Notes. Big thanks to senior producer Joe Schreiner, producers Sarah Holtz and Reggie Morris, 
and to our business manager and social media maven, Maddie Mulladew. Come visit us anytime in our Louisiana Eats studio at the Southern Food and Beverage Museum. We're on Instagram and Facebook, too. Louisiana Eats is a production of Poppy Tooker Broadcasting. 